Hello, and uh, a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking time to make a deep dive into cities' green havens and to share and discuss nature-based solutions. Our generation is the first to live entire lives in cities, and perhaps we might also be the last able to truly act on climate change. This year, UN's Biodiversity Panel released a report on biodiversity, urging radical and immediate change on all levels of society. And by July, we used up all regenerative resources of 2019. In fact, we started to consume more than the planet can regenerate in a year. So, what if we were the first green green generation of cities that took this challenge and put it into real action. At SLA, sorry, at SLA we want to give nature a place at the heart of the city. Together with the city of Copenhagen, we have made a Copenhagen model that defines not only the quantitative assets of city nature, but also the numerous qualities and qualitative benefits a roadmap of values, meaning that you can, for example, both reduce CO2 and delay rainwater, and at the same time connect an entire neighborhood with nature experience that makes people healthier and happier. This park is called the Soul of Nørrebro. It allows 18,000 of 18,000 cubic meters of rainwater to be stored in case of an extreme rain event. I remember the first time I visited the park. I was captivated by these magnificent, large, beautiful trees that are in fact some of Copenhagen's oldest. And we set out to transform this place in a way that preserved that defining experience. Because nature's ecosystems, services can clean air, filter noise, prevent heat islands, manage rainwater, and make our cities more resilient, if designed with multidisciplinary knowledge. But on top, city nature creates safer, healthier communities that aspires kindness and conversations. That is what I would reclaim is urban green havens. And they might not look as you expect. This is in fact a standard roundabout in the middle of Copenhagen. It used to be a transit corridor for traffic, paved by asphalt. Now it's a condensed grown nature-based environment of 600 trees and 28,000 plants that not only facilitates the same amount of traffic, but also collects and reuses rainwater only by taking one-third of the asphalt away. I recently met an older lady who told me she already has her favorite bench where she enjoys a coffee and her everyday life while birds are singing and butterflies are thriving. So, climate change and adaptation in our cities is for me an opportunity to let nature lead the way. And to take this session even further, I now welcome on stage Joyce Ma, the China Country Director of Nature Conservancy, to tell us about how they conserve lands and waters on which all our lives depend. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this speaking opportunity. We all know that um, the um, city, the greatest threats to cities nowadays are excessive heat, air and uh, water um, pollutions, and also most importantly, the poor planned developments. At the Nature Conservancy, uh, we believe those threats are of course uh, difficult, but solvable challenges. Uh, we've been working around the world in like 70 cities to demonstrate 
how uh, nature-based solutions can be part of the answers to address to or to uh, transform cities to be uh, more livable and resilient uh, to this rapidly uh, uh, warming climate. Um, nature, of course, has many benefits to um, to, uh, to cities, um, but one of the lessons we've learned in the in this process is that uh, the most durable and uh, effective uh, solutions must be planned across all sectors or um, uh, jurisdictions of a city or metropolitan regions. And this actually is the concept of co-design in order to optimize the co-benefits of urban nature. Uh, yesterday, exactly here, we heard about um, the mayor of Rotterdam mentioned spatial planning and also breaking silos. And this is exactly the message for um, for the mayors here. Uh, one example we have been uh, involved is we have supported uh, the metropolitan city um, Melbourne in Australia in their using this integrated co-design um, approach in their greening process. And this model has also been uh, replicated in uh, Milan, uh, Italy. So this is, uh, we firmly believe this is the way forward in our uh, city planning process. I also wanted to, to share a bit of uh, my uh, perspective on uh, China, uh, Chinese government important initiative in addressing the urban challenges. That is the sponge city, you might have heard. Uh, sponge is a direct translation from Chinese, referring to its main uh, feature. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's a stormwater management system. That is to absorb more stormwater into the soil rather than running off to the, um, to, to the drainage systems. Uh, maybe it's useful to look at it, why this uh, was started in the first place. You know, um, China urbanized very rapidly in the last 40 years in relation to its uh, economy expansion. Around 500 million people moved from countryside to cities um, in this process. Uh, so China built its cities very fast. As a matter of fact, so fast, with no time to consider environments and human well-being outcomes. So this resulted many problems, and one of which is constant flooding in Chinese eastern uh, cities that caused many human misery, including taking many people's lives and also um, environmental uh, degradation. Um, but unfortunately, the, um, the climate projection indicates that those big rain events will um, increase in frequency. So the, the central government has realized it is not enough to, uh, to get out of, the, address those problems in uh, traditional ways, like um, dipping deeper uh, ditches and build more pumps or uh, larger uh, pipes. So they have to use a different approach. They looked to nature, um, of course, coupled with new technologies. And they have um, ambitious goals to turn or transform a considerable part of urban landscapes uh, to, to be uh, sponges, um, basically to make the city's surface more permeable, uh, to let the nature take care of or uh, solve part of the problems. Um, I don't have time for more details of this, but I wanted to say this is probably the largest um, urban green infrastructure program that's ever implemented, and that with investment close to 300 billion US dollars by next year. Um, one more um, perspective I wanted to share with you is the um, if you go to China nowadays, if you hear about Chinese talking about the environment, there's a new phrase called eco-civilization. Eco-civilization uh, was uh, enshrined or written into uh, China's constitution in 2012. Um, some people interpret it, it it's a sort of a sustainable uh, development uh, with Chinese characteristics 
to which I don't quite agree. However, I do find it difficult to translate it into uh, English. Uh, let me give it a try. I think it has um, ancient roots uh, in a Chinese philosophy, but with a, um, with a new or modern framework uh, about a new way of uh, problem solving uh, systems uh, based on uh, protect and enhance uh, nature capital. You probably heard hear phrases like gold is green. So this is how to maintain how to maintain um, uh, ecological integrity um, uh, from at different levels. Um, nowadays, no matter it's, uh, but I believe respect nature and also put nature first is the most fundamental distinction between ecological civilization and uh, a broader view of sustainable development. Nowadays, in, no matter it's in the makings or in the uh, actions, um, eco ecological concepts are, um, are positioned rather central to China's priorities, uh, which include climate change resilience and also biodiversity uh, conservation. So with all this, I remain relatively optimistic that Chinese cities will be better and livable and more resilient in a foreseeable future. Thank you very much for your attention. Manage. Thank you very much, Joyce Ma. Nice to hear about your fantastic work and putting nature first. We can definitely, we are on the same road. And uh, now I would like to invite the panel on stage. First, Fernando Medina, Mayor of Lisbon. If you could take a seat over here. Then uh, Justina Glusman, Deputy Mayor of Warsaw for Sustainable Development and Green Areas. Fierhard Hakim. I don't know if I pronounce it right, but Fernanda Makhakim, all right. Mayor of Kolkata, a warm welcome to you. India, India definitely. I guess, I, I think they all got that. <laughs> and last, not least, Penny Hulse, Councillor of Auckland. So, thank you very much for joining us here for this deep dive session. Uh, first, I would like to give you a question, Fernando. I hope it's all right that I call you first names. I'm Mette. Um, Lisbon is creating nine green corridors to build ecological continuity across the city. How do increased and connected green spaces help tackle urban heat and flooding in Lisbon, or does it? Hello, good morning to all. Thank you very much for, for your question. Um, the, the project of connecting, creating a green structures and connecting all the green structures in Lisbon is an old dream, an old dream by ah. architects, by a very, the, the father of green urban planning in Portugal, Gonçalo Ribeiro tells that from many decades inspired people to have the green corridors of Lisbon. We have a very big park in Lisbon, nine, 900 hectares in, in, a, in a small city like Lisbon in area. And they had an old dream of connecting all that structure, green structure around the city. So 10 years ago, the job started with my predecessor, Antonio Costa, now the Prime Minister of Portugal, where he put in the, they changed the, the municipal, the, the, uh, director of municipal plan, so the main instrument of planning the territory, where we put inside more 400 hectares of green spaces. So um, after that, it was building it, uh, mm. the most difficult, just get it done. <laughs> and um, well, we began building them, uh, and, and it is an amazing process because each time we, we begin building it, it begins 
being used by people. Okay. It's beginning using a, a very positive effect on fighting the heat waves that we are very strongly affected in Lisbon because we are one of the capitals. We are the capital that is nearest the North Africa, so and the, the, the movements of, of wind. And um, and the people begin to, to use it frequently, fight the heat waves. And at the same time, uh, it they were designed in the way that they could support the the flooding event. Mm -hmm. So it was natural renaturalization of areas that mm -hmm. was concrete or were not used or were planned to be buildings. They were now planned to be uh, green areas, very large green areas that connect valleys. Valleys connect to big parking areas. And um, and they, they, they make this all at the same time. And the natural, they are now a natural barrier to floodings events that in Lisbon they occur much more frequently because of climate change. And then it's a way of natural drainage, retaining water and putting naturally in the system. It's, it's working amazingly. And uh, what's happening now in my term is we are almost ending the dream of Gonçalo Ribeiro Teles. We don't have more corridors to make, but uh, we have much more trees to plant. Yes, thank you so much. And you also won the European Green Capital for 2020. Isn't it true? Yes. I we, have to come and visit. Yes, you should come. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone are invited to, yeah. to see and uh, to see that what I'm talking is true. Huh? You have to... Mm. <laughs> 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 um, no, we, we, we won that, uh, that distinction last year. We are very proud of it. Obviously, we are not the greenest capital when we compare to North European countries. Uh, but uh, we are very proud of the evolution that we made on uh, several indicators on water treatment, sanitary, on garbage, and uh, on green infrastructure. And uh, what we are pushing now after finishing the green corridors, it's we are pushing forward this in, in a sense that you talk in your presentation in the beginning. So it's a project that we have that is each neighborhood with a square, a square in each neighborhood. Mm. What means is that we transform areas of heavy traffic mm. and low space for people in areas for people where people circulate and basically around trees. Um, and, and it is amazing because when, when I, I, I entered as mayor in 2015, mm -hmm. I replaced the previous mayor, so I was not elected in the beginning. And uh, we decided to make a lot of works. And everyone in the city has told me, the guy is crazy. The guy is, 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 doesn't know what he's doing. It's so many public works at the same time. It's, it's, uh, and, and it happens something that my colleagues uh, now tell me that it happens everywhere. So in the beginning, people hate public works because mm. it's only a problem. Yeah. In the day when we opened the, the, the public works, when we, finish, when we finish the main avenue in Lisbon, when, where we, put, we take out traffic lanes and we put 750 trees in the main avenue, build two cyclones, lanes, uh, a cyclone lane and, dedic and a shared cyclone lane in the other side. Uh, in the day that we stopped, the, the public work ended. So people looked and say, wow, probably those guys are right. Fantastic. And most funny, yeah. if you talk to the people three months after, people say, OK, this is good. I had that idea before. <laughs> 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 it is their idea. So it's the best victory then for us. Then you actually do succeed. Yes, we do. When and people then, find that it's their yes, idea it's, and they implement their idea, it, that's a good one. And now one. in the fourth month, they get to complain, oh, the mayor is not doing enough. So he has to do another <laughs> thing. <laughs> no, very all right. Good. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, Justina, uh, why is it important for Warsaw to create more urban spaces for people? And what role does, I mean, that is part of your job, I guess, to, uh, to make more green areas for the citizens of Warsaw. So what role does nature or city nature play in that respect? Well, obviously, everybody probably agrees that urban green areas are fundamental for the quality of life of the citizens. And as we have seen in the movie at the beginning, there are various and numerous uh, benefits from green areas. I will not repeat uh, those. Nevertheless, in the context of climate change, they are even more important because they are helping us to adapt to the changes that are already there, to the crisis that is already there, uh, as we heard yesterday. And one of the speakers yesterday, I'm not sure if not Al Gore, he said that adaptation 
uh, is a condition for mitigation. So yes. we are already there in those cities and we already have to do something. And in a few years, great majority of the citizens of the world will be living, will live in cities. Mm. So that raises the importance of the good space, of the greenery and uh, of measures adapting cities to the conditions that are already there happening. So we have numerous projects and um, related to green areas. As in previous uh, years, Warsaw put more priority to hard infrastructure. In the new tenure, our new mayor, Rafał Trzaskowski, he put a lot of attention and put a priority on the green infrastructure, green and blue infrastructure. These are also the fundamental elements of the adaptation plan the ADAPT city that we have um, adopted in uh, July this year. And uh, just to be brief, we are enlarging the uh, green spaces, especially green streets in the city center, where we have to, uh, when we have the uh, heat, uh, the urban heat island, heat island yeah. and biodiversity. Wow in uh, other areas of the city is also like crucial uh, project. So we are planting trees along the street, in the parks, we establish new parks, and we also expand city forests. These are reservoirs of biodiversity, very important element of also uh, in green infrastructure. As to the water, obviously, probably as yes, with other cities, flooding, is the recent uh, challenge that mm. we more and more have to address. So we are creating new reservoirs of the excessive waters. Uh, we are also providing subsidies from the city budget for citizens for building local retention containers. So we want to encourage citizens to act mm. by themselves. We do our own job as well yeah. on a larger scale. Um, and you yeah. also have, ha, you announced this campaign in 2017. Yeah, Plant the million, a million trees. trees with yeah, us. million trees project is yeah. uh, like an umbrella project which uh, gathers all other elements related to tree planting. Actually, it started in 2017. Uh, well, million trees is a symbol, but nevertheless, I'm taking it seriously. I try to put <laughs> million trees in Warsaw. Uh, by the end of this tenure, we have around 350 um, trees already planted. And uh, as I said, the smaller components of these projects are the green streets, green local neighborhoods, city forests. We have enlarged them by 50 hectares this year. And uh, that's one of the successes. What's not easy, because not everyone believes a forest is, you know, indispensable part of the city. Uh -uh. But I am deeply convinced that's the case. Um, and yeah, we are we are uh, trying to trying to reach one million uh, by the end of the tenure, which is in 2023. That's yeah. my goal. <laughs> Good. But it's true, we need to sort of change our mindset towards how a city looks and how it performs with well, city nature. Well, that's expected by the citizens yeah. as well. Yeah. It's not only the belief of the mayor and my own. I have a, a pleasure to be, uh, an honor to be in charge of this project. And I deeply believe in its sense, but it's also a response to citizens' requests. And um, we have talked a lot during previous sessions about the governmental policies versus self-governmental policies and the differences that mayors are indeed closer to the citizens. Mm. The citizens come with concrete requests. I want a park. I want to have the trees and the green area next to my house. Mm. And we, as mayors, as a representative of these citizens, we well are obliged to you know uh, take the take the challenge and uh, and uh, and realize those projects mm. so there are two reasons internal reasons and external one thank you justina um well firm fiad hakim sorry uh kolkata is kolkata is a big city a huge city and one of the biggest i guess in the world at least Kolkata, you experience uh, intense heat, spells, and flooding from the sea. 
Um, how does greenery in Kolkata help to address those climate hazards? Actually, the greenery helps to maintain the air quality and to reduce the carbon. Mm. And that is the way we are aware of these hazards. But thinking that Calcutta is not only a big city, it is hugely densely populated city. True. And the migration is too high there. Yeah. And the people living below the poverty line is very much there in that region, not only in Calcutta, but in all of that region. So it is, the problem is different from the European cities or the American cities to the, our Asian cities, mm. especially the cities in this part of the world. So we have to, for the, for the keeping the greenery, we have to give, provide the shelters for the poor. Yeah. Otherwise they will waste the greeneries. Yeah. And as I am also the uh, urban development minister of that state, in, in, the, in the state government, provincial government. So I have brought a legislation there that calls LUDCP, Land Use and Development Plan. Mm -hmm. And with that plan, uh, the people are restricted to encourage the green spaces. Nowadays, just two years, we are seeing that we call it a cloud burst. The cloud comes and it bursts and causes the flood. This, 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 it is, in, in the recent days, it is happening there in, in all the yeah. Indian areas. Now, in last week, the Bihar and the Uttar Pradesh, the other states, were densely populated. The huge flood came there, and still the water is below the uh, first floor in every town below the above the first floor. Now, so we have to deal with this, and I don't have the idea with the huge population and how to deal with this because the thing is that. Uh, Greenery is must. What I felt here, that yes, you have to be green, you have to maintain the air quality, because I believe as a mayor of Calcutta, that bad roads, the people will, uh, will, yeah. will be, I'm now with you, light, the people have, will be go against you. Mm. But the bad, air quality is bad. <laughs> the, yeah. whom, the, the population will disappear. Yes. They all die. So this is the main thing that we are doing there. But we have restricted that urban forestry. Yes. We have started urban forestry there. We are in the roads, we have started the urbanize this forestry in, in between these uh, two roads. And we are trying hard to maintain this, uh, all, all, all the, uh, what you call this, uh, all the open space. We yeah. have we have changed the law also. You can you can make high rise, but you have to space the open, have, open space yeah. there. You have to have and, a and, balance. And the water body. It yeah. is restricted that you have to create a water body there. And for that, we are having the facility of giving rebate in the taxes also. Yeah. So we are doing that very hardly with yeah. this thickly populated area. We are figuring out the ways how to f solve the problem. And I think that it is, it is a challenge before the us, before the whole world, this is a challenge for us. Because the developed countries has already shooted up the, uh, the heat, yes. and we, the developing country, are going in the same path. So mm. this is the time where we have the consciousness, and we have to do the best thing for the citizen of our world. Thank you. Thank you, Fihad, very much. I can only, uh, I can't really grasp the size of your city and of your problems, but it's nice to hear how you think of synergies between different plannings and projects that you implement. Hmm. But uh, another, another question I would like to ask is, how do you, how do you work with this urban forestation or urban afforestation in, in relation to, to poor people taking housing in the, in the park? No, we, we have to go there and convince them because our is a very strong democracy there. In yeah. India, yes. we have a very strong democracy. And the people are concerned about that. So convincing the people is the more than to work. Yes. To convince okay. the people, to convince the, the, 
to have the stakeholders in, in your confidence is a major task of yeah. a mayor, of a minister, even of, of a chief minister. Yes. So we, we are doing that. We are, we are having a community meetings there and, and giving that, the, yes, now we are building a house for you. But the thing is that we have to keep the open spaces there. Yes. You live in that house, you, you have all the, you used, to, you, you used to live in a heart. But compromising the 16 hearts together, we made a multi-storied there. Yes. This housing for urban poor. And the open space should be left out for the greeneries. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Well, Penny, we yesterday we heard a series of speak on uh, on uh, on about how the need for social justice in climate change is, and how 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 do we keep it equal and not um, you know balancing in the wrong way. So, how how does that look like in in Auckland? Uh, uh, kia ora koutou, katoa, and um, warm greetings from Aotearoa, from the tiniest country, one of the tiniest <laughs> countries here from New Zealand. Um, first of all, it is daunting, you know, listening to the, the issues that this wonderful mayor on my right is facing in Kolkata, sitting yesterday with the uh, mayor of Karachi and the mayor of Johannesburg. You know, there's no excuse why New Zealand can't absolutely be leading the world. We are not facing these problems. But we are facing, and I feel that we've been the exacerbator. You know, it is first world countries who, the, who are the exacerbators. So we almost need to double, redouble, quadruple our, our efforts. So from Auckland's perspective, we are, and, you know, again, it's relative. Poverty in Auckland isn't comparative to the poverty that, you know, we're thinking about. But if we look at the tree cover in our in our beautiful city, we've got about 18% tree cover across our city, but we've got 74% tree cover in the wealthy areas and about 7% tree cover in the poor areas. So we've got that that disparity. It's always the the poorer and more challenged areas that you know a are going to feel the first impacts of climate change, b have lack of urban amenity, and c lack of trees. So a couple of things we're doing to address that. We've also got a Mayor's Million Tree Project and our, um, the term of this council ends tonight. So we have planted our million trees, we've made it. But what we're also doing is making sure that in the next term that those that Mayor's next million dollar tree project is concentrated in our areas that are challenged. But the critical thing is it's not just tree planting, it's how we develop those urban amenity and green spaces. And as we densify and go upward so that we're not spreading our city outward and making transport and carbon more of an issue, that we create those beautiful green urban spaces that are the luxurious lounges for our community as they live in increased density and in more challenged urban conditions. And just watching the work that's being done here and in Copenhagen, I take my hat off to you. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. But um, another question for you could be, how do you balance between protecting land and, and natural environments and developing them? Or And that's a constant problem around the world. You know, by New Zealand standards, again, we're not, <laughs> we're not dealing with the growth impacts, but our city is 1.7 million people. We're growing by 44,000 a year. So that's quite a, a, a sizable mm. impact. So our pressure is to go up and not to use up green spaces. But we are using, and um, one of the things I'm proud of in, in New Zealand, we do work in close partnership with our First Nations people, with our Māori community, and the partnership with Māori is having a really big impact on our ability to protect open spaces, our iconic um, volcanic cones, our landscapes that were previously being degraded are now protected by legislation and run in partnership with our, our um, Māori treaty partners. The other challenge we've got, of course, is purchasing new open space in a highly dense urban environment with some of the most expensive housing in the world is a challenge, but we have to do it, and it's one of the biggest debates we've got with our community, is buying new urban space. But in saying that, we're trying to incorporate, as other cities are, using adaptation and mitigation for climate change as 
a way of increasing our open space. We're managing stormwater by developing open space, building bikeways and increasing those that urban amenity to mitigate climate change but also create that better environment. So it's a little bit sneaky. We can call it infrastructure, we can capitalise it, um, but what we're actually doing is creating good urban space and a good urban environment. Thank you very much. This morning we heard the Prime Minister of Denmark saying that every morning she woke up she was a social democrat. So in this whole climate change and climate adaptation and action, her heart felt very strongly that it should not make the city more gentrified or more unequal. Um, that is a perspective that is also important with regards to green or beautification or nature in the proximity for houses and and uh, companies and so forth, because it, it tends to make the real estate value increase. So that could be a general question uh, for all of you, uh, since how, how, how do you work with that? And you said that, that in the rich areas of Auckland, it was around 70% canopy cover, and in the lower income or the more challenged areas, it was 23 how, I mean, that is, how, how, how can we do that different? Justina, yeah, please. Is it working? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. working. <laughs> yeah, I had, uh, I wanted to draw on these uh, previous uh, uh, statements. Actually, I think the uh, trees, uh, the, the aspect of the greenery areas and that it's often, uh, omitted is the uh, you know the democratic angle that it gives. It's a public space that is being available, accessible to all. So if you want to have a city for all, you need to create the public green areas. And in fact, uh, it's very interesting when said about Auckland. And I think we are having a similar challenge. We have started a project of the canopy map for all the city. And I think it's a crucial project for the management of the city to actually see what is happening, how different areas are treated with regard to the quality of public space, because quality of public space is actually defined by the uh, greenery and uh, proximity to green areas. As uh, we all know, as you have mentioned, the property prices next to parks, forests are higher than in other places. So in order to work on equality of the city, the city leaders have to focus on actually putting trees in concrete places, putting new parks in concrete places. And we are actually uh, having this in mind while um, planning the development of new areas and our new parks and new green areas are actually uh, being planned in the place, in the city districts that are less affluent mm. than, uh, than others. Uh, so definitely this, definitely meaning putting trees and creating new green areas in appropriate space. So it's promoting equality and not gentrification. But I believe an important aspect is also relations with developers. So the city is not actually taking the cost of green areas created by private entrepreneurs um, and redirecting the uh, big part of resources where they should not be redirected, basically to streaming them into direction yeah. when it's, uh, you know, Thank the, you. the private time money is flying. will not... I'm not to interrupt, but I just want to make okay. it possible. So we are down on, on two sharp minutes, then I do like three, but I mean two. Uh, yes. This also we have experienced, but there is a famous dialogue when, when I was elected mayor last seven months ago. Green city, clean city project. And we have created 2,200 parks in the, in, the, in the poor areas. Wow. In the poor areas. That's nice. The, 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 the person below the poverty line, he needs a green space. Yes. Because they, they don't have, have enough room in their inside. house, no, no, inside their no, house. No. So they, they need the green space to live, to, to let their children go there and play there. Yeah. 
Wow. So yeah. that is a very popular green city, clean city project, mm. which I am, I have just given that. And within these eight years, I am mayor of seven years, but I am minister for the last eight years. This 200 and 200, uh, 2,200 parks has been created there. That's quite an achievement. <laughs> Fernando, please. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think the, the question we, is not on the side of trees or parks of, of nature. The, the, the question is on the side of housing supply. The question is that I don't believe that it's possible for a great uh, for a city that is becoming increasingly global uh, to uh, avoid gentrification and to be a city with opportunities for all if we don't have a very strong uh, supply of housing that is completely out of the market. Mm. Market itself regulating housing, it's, it's not providing housing for a successful city. No. It's a contradiction in its terms. If you see, if a city is more uh, if, uh, effective in the global stage, capturing talent, retaining talent, have new companies, um, if the housing is solely on the market, it is going yeah. to be impossible to solve True. the equation. True. So uh, what we are making in Lisbon is we are building our own houses. Yes. We, had, we had built a lot of houses in the 80s and the 90s for poor people. Now we are building houses for middle classes. Uh, we are um, developing projects with private partners to, to, to build houses that we are going to hire to people, middle classes, and the criteria is that people just pay 30% of the net income, not more, not less. Oh, wow. And, uh, and, and I, I think that we have to have this policy till we have basically 40%, 50% of, house, of the, avail the whole houses in city, they have to be on public control. Because if you don't have that, basically Good. I said it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, let me speak yeah. frankly. Yeah. Because I want my city to go forward. I want my city to strive to have the most talented guys, companies. That strategy is going to widen the gap of, of rights of people that, that, that don't have that ability. So I cannot fail on social cohesion, on social side of sustainability, because I'm successful mm. in the economic side of sustainability, mm. or because I'm successful on the environmental approach. Obviously, when I make a good park, prices are rising around. Obviously, they are. But yes. I'm going not to, to do the park. No, I have to build houses for my own or create a scheme that those houses are prices house of the market because houses are a human right, a social right protected in, in the Declaration of Human Rights, in Portuguese constitution, in our law of health. Housing, mm. and we have to give it the priority that is have with, with, with programs yes. that put those houses out of the market and in hands of people. So okay. nice to hear that. But we even have that national regulation here in Denmark that we need to diversify the when we develop land or when we build houses. We need to diversify the offers and have both social housing and private housing and so forth. And there tends to be time where people actually can go around that rule. I don't know if you experienced that, and we don't have time for talking about that. But thank you so much. Very inspiring, all of you. I'm sorry you only had one round, but you had a good one. <laughs> thank you. She has a very beautiful city. I visited it too, yeah. Thank you. So I'll... Thank you. Oh, sorry. No, you should stay. I, it's, it's my first time being a moderator. I'm a little bit new on it. Please have a seat again. We have a Q&A. Mandy. Oh, sorry about that. Now, uh, on the app you got, Mayor Summit 2019, on the lowest left corner, there's kind of a magnifier icon. There you can type in a question. And there will be a floating microphone. This one. And uh, we'll see what pops up. Please have some questions for the panel. The question will appear here, and I can also read it out loud. Um, 
Yeah, I'm sorry about that. But then you got all up and down again. All right. Could global north cities, Nordic cities, somehow support global south cities in enhancing green spaces or other city-to-city -city networks working to green together for climate and city? So, I guess the point here is, is there a way of city-to-city -city learning and experience that could enhance the process or... You, yeah, I owe her one. <laughs> so first you. I'm, I'm really interested in this and just thinking about the previous discussion with, you know, the challenges of um, cities that have the luxury of being able to do this and the cities where this is, you know, a, a huge issue. I, you know, I don't always agree that the trade-off, we fly and then mm. we, you know, we, we pay for our carbon offsets by planting trees. But I think there must be a better way for us to look at developed countries and first world countries thinking really creatively about where we might invest in the ability to green other areas. And we, I don't think we've thought necessarily creatively enough. So thinking about Kolkata and thinking about the the offset carbon plantings that we might do in Auckland, it would be a really interesting thing to see what some of those those city twinnings and joinings might might look like. I think it's really worth an experimental discussion. Thank you very much. Fernando, did you have a comment? Just, just, sorry, just a brief one on that. Um, I think in the north cities we have a lot of learn of some inspiration on south cities. Uh, I'm amazingly jealous of what Ethiopia is doing. Uh, no one in the world is doing what they are doing. They no. are amazing. It's and amazing. Uh, everyone is making an incredible effort, so I think we don't have anything to teach Three on that. Three million trees in one day. And, uh, and, and they just continue doing that. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, so I think everyone is very, and this network is a, it's a very good example of exchange of practices, and we see this all around the world. I don't think North has any, any lesson to teach to the South cities on this. All right. We have another one. How has greening been prioritized in your city budgeting? Fierhard. Actually, in, in, in our, our part of the world, this, uh, the budget is of the government. Okay. And we have a different department of uh, the of the parks and squares and the urban 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 plantation so that that creates the around 25% of my budget for the greeneries in calcutta corporations budget and we have we are very serious about it if you consider the state as i am a state minister we have planted 2 lakhs trees this last 2 years we have planted 2 lakhs trees uh, so this, this, we are taking it very seriously. Mm -hmm. Our state government is taking it very seriously. Mamta Banerjee is, is a activist in this field also. Okay. So she is taking it very seriously, and we have a budget there. Of course, no private participation is there, but the government has their own budget over there. Mm. Cool, twenty-five percent. That's a lot. Yes. Justina. I believe it's not only budgeting, but also the organizational structure, which is very important for trees planting, and then management as well. Because we face, due to the climate change, a problem with managing the trees because of the drought and not enough uh, rain. And actually, I would like to learn from southern cities how they manage with the trees, because this is an uh, apparent problem that appeared last year. Coming back to the organizational structures, Warsaw is a decentralized city. We have 18 districts, but the city management has been centralized for majority of bigger uh, green areas and larger streets as well. So we have created two years ago a separate entity, the Green um, Management uh, Unit, and this city company is actually in charge of uh, planting and then maintenance of um, large part of green areas in Warsaw. And the citizens have noticed and we get a lot of positive feedback that trees are being well, planted in much larger numbers. That's the first point. And secondly, better taken care of. Once this year, due to the weather conditions, 
we have faced a new challenge that I will love to ask my colleagues from the South, actually, how they manage that. <laughs> Thank you. I think one of one of the questions that uh, that we try to avoid is to look at uh, a green uh, budget in the sense of the green or an environmental department budget, because green green strategy in the city is a global one. Mm. Uh, so when I put money on public transport, and I and I have to raise taxes to put money on, on public transport, or I have to make another decision, I put in the money on green. When I have to put money on rebuilding social neighborhoods to uh, increase the energy efficiency or to put electrical solar panels or to make systems of reusing mm. water, mm. it's green. Mm. It's the same green where I put investment on green parks or when I have public spaces work. So the question is about global. Uh, mm. It's about this, this, all these measures came in, in housing, in transportation, in, in all types of departments. And obviously, they, they, mm. they have a big part and a big share of, of the budget. The second is creating instruments for the participation of people. Um, we decided to create a 5 million participatory green budget mm. to next year to the green capital. So it is going to be 5 million that is going to be available to projects of, for people, for mm. young people that want to make a park, a garden. I don't know their idea. Mm. Uh, normally, they are going uh, lots of good ideas, amazing ideas. Uh, normally a little bit more expensive than they should be, but uh, that's life. We need to get money to pay for them. And, but that's a different part. That's putting the money in the hands of the citizen. But other part, green budget, it has to be old budget, has to be green in mm. all the departments. So. True. And yes, you can. We have one minute. I just want to reflect quickly on what you are talking about. Uh, the, the project you are referring to in Ethiopia and Addis Ababa, it was actually 3.5 million trees in less than 12 hours. So I do agree, Justina, that we can learn from that empowerment. That's also what you are reflecting on lastly, uh, to actually get the citizens involved in that. Okay. <laughs> actually, we have a Shobu Street project there. Every child is born there. Will get a, the, the parent will get a tree, and they have to maintain that tree along with their child. Ah, that's beautiful. That is a street That's project. a beautiful one. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've last, got that, that in Auckland You'll as have well. the last note on Thank this Thank you. One. A yeah. very quick last word, and it, it's a slightly political one. I don't know if this is the same in other cities, but I imagine it is. When people stand for the mayoralty or for council, they say, we will keep rates down, we'll keep taxes down, and we'll keep the budget low. We suffer the same politics in Auckland, but we went out to our community last year and we said, but what if we raise the budget by a few percent purely for the environment, for trees, and to improve water quality, and we went out to the whole city, not just the same old grey-haired people that we go to normally and hear from normally. The city came back resoundingly and said, put the budget up for the environment and for water quality. And for me, that just says we need to change the politics, listen to all our community, and not just the same empowered, grey-haired old people we always listen to. Thank you. Yes. Do you want the mayors to stay? I'm sorry, I'm a little bit... You can take your seats. I'm nervous and doing anything wrong. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. That was enlightening, at least for me. I hope it was for you as well. I now welcome Elodie Grimoin. Is it rightly pronounced? I have a little bit French in my, in my, in my veins. On stage, co-founder and CTO of Urban Canopy. She and her fellow, fellow in, fellows and, and people in Urban Canopy won the C40 Woman for Climate Tech Challenge in 2019. Well done. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Vincent has seen them.
my name is Elodie, and I am an urban canoper. Now, I didn't come here to warn you about the potential upcoming climate emergency. It's already here. I didn't come here today to tell you if political inaction toward climate change continues. Young people will take to the streets. Last month, over a million of them around the world have already done so. If I'm here today, it's to tell you that if we increase green spaces by a quarter in our cities, we will lower its temperatures by two to four degrees. If we increase green spaces by a quarter in our cities, we will encourage biodiversity to thrive. And if we increase green spaces by a quarter in our cities, we will improve the health and the well-being for its inhabitants. But how to achieve this target when available real estate is diminishing, land prices are rising, and surfaces are increasingly covered in concrete? Well, if I am here today, it's to tell you that solutions do exist and it is urgent to act by implementing them in all cities. Solutions, those proposed by Penny, Justina, Fernando, and Ferrat. Because if we wait too long, it will be too late. At Urban Canopy, we provide solution to green urban spaces differently where planting directly in the ground is not an option. We provide self-standing, modular, and lightweight structures, which facilitate the rapid greening on surfaces available on the ground, on the building roof, and on the building facades where trees cannot be planted. Thanks to our autonomous and connected smart irrigation systems, Clabby plants watering is managed to perfection, assisting to preserve a resource of increasing scarcity, water. Our plant canopies help combat heat accumulated in our cities, reduce harmful health pollution, and restore biodiversity, making communities greener, healthier, and happier. In addition, we imagine and design low-carbon solution. We are Women for Climate, prize winner by C40 Cities this year, and we will build five corals, corals at Paris on the square in front of the National Library of France. An urban canopy is a green change maker, a green change maker, and I'd like to share with you that if I choose to embark on this career path, is to commit to devote all my skills and all my energy to serve global climate resilience. I strive to act every day to pass on more livable and breathable cities to my and future generation. More livable and breathable, and therefore more inhabitable because beyond the ecological consequences, climate change will become the first cause of human migration due to droughts, rising waters, hurricanes, and desertification. So today, I need you, all of you, for the Green New Deal to green maker together and make our cities green again, all together. Thank you. Okay, this is it. It's a little bit, three minutes over time. That's my fault. But I uh, thank you so much for staying here and a special thank you to the three mayors and the councillor for enlightening us and a warm, warm thank you to you, Lodi. I need to know more about your projects and also to Joyce Ma. Sorry about that.